Hey guys, this is Mr. Kennedy back with video 25. We're going to be talking about food chains and food webs. And then we talk about feeding relationships is basically what we're talking about. We've got to realize that energy flows through an ecosystem in one direction. Now, this little diagram down here shows you the sun, which we consider to be the ultimate source of all energy, sends energy to autotrophs, right? Autotrophs then take that energy and convert it into their own food, which they use to support themselves and then heterotrophs eat them so these arrows show which way energy flows it ultimately comes from the sun then the plants or autotrophs or chemotrophs and then eventually to heterotrophs which are consumers so this is kind of the pathway we're talking about here when we start talking about food chains so you know notice that energy is flowing in that direction it only flows one way it doesn't recycle itself now Here's some examples of food chains. One thing I need to tell you is that food chains always need to start off with a producer or an autotroph. If you look at the first one up here, we've got grass is eaten by a rat, which is eaten by a snake, which is eaten by an eagle. All right, this is a food chain. Now, if I were to draw the arrows in this food chain, it would be there would be an arrow here, an arrow here, an arrow here. Of course, we've got the sun up here in the corner somewhere. We're not really concerned about, but the plant gets its energy from the sun. It uses some of that energy to grow, to maintain itself, to metabolize, to respire, uh, and then some of the energy is released as heat, but what's left, the mouse gets of that when he eats the plant. And then the mouse is going to use some of that energy it gets to, to run around, to, to metabolize its food, to respire, and then when the snake eats it, it gets a little bit less energy, and as you go on up the line, energy decreases as you move upward. Now the next one down here, the next food chain, would be the insects, the bass, to the blue heron. Um, you know, energy again is flowing from left to right. The next food chain is, of course, the cow. I mean, the grass is eaten by the cows, which is eaten by the boy. You know, that's the food chain. Now, one of these food chains, if I asked you to give it to me on a test, would be incorrect. And the food chain that would be incorrect if you gave it to me on a test would be this one right here. The reason this one be incorrect is because it doesn't start with a producer. All food chains, all food webs need to start off with a producer. Now that's going to be either an autotroph, like a plant, or it's going to be a chemotroph, like a, a tube worm or something like that. So all food chains have to start off with that and they move up. Now this food chain is a little bit better and it explains a lot more things. You can see here there are five steps in the food chain. I could even number them for you. This is step one, two, three, four, and five. There's five parts of the food chain. Now scientists usually say that food chains shouldn't be over five steps because they come, become inefficient. But if you'll notice, the energy actually comes from the sun and it flows from the grass to the grasshopper, from the grasshopper to the snake, from the snake to the hawk, and from the hawk to the fungi. Now, energy only flows in one direction. So the energy that came from the sun is one way. Now, what recycles, though, are nutrients. Nutrients actually recycle throughout the system. So, you know, think about that. Elements that you have inside your body, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, etc., might have been in some other organism hundreds of years ago, millions of years ago, uh, billions of years ago. It might have been the same elements and nutrients that you have in you. Uh, might have been in something else one time long ago. Now, when we look at this, the producer is in the first line here. These are producers. We're talking about plants, right? Autotrophs, usually, is what we're th talking about here. Now, the second one is called a primary consumer. Primary consumer means it's the first one to consume. Now, if we think about that, that would probably have to be a herbivore or an omnivore, right? You couldn't put a carnivore in this place because a carnivore doesn't eat plants. Uh, the secondary consumer, you know, would be your carnivores, maybe your omnivore here as well. But no, herbivores can't be here because they don't eat other living material, I mean, meat material. So there are certain things that can occur at certain steps along the food chain. Now these steps, like I told you, there's five of them here. These steps are called trophic levels or feeding steps. Alright, so there's five feeding levels here and it shows how 
energy goes from one step to the next step to the next step to eventually get to the decomposer, which breaks all the nutrients down and returns them back to the soil. Alright, now I want to show you the difference between a food chain and a food web. A food chain shows only one single possible way that the energy can be flowing through an environment. Now, a food web shows multiple ways. For example, in this one, krill are the producers, okay? But I can give you one food chain. It goes to the crab eater seal and into the leopard seal. Now, that would be a three-step, a three-trophic level food chain. But realize that's not the only possibility th possible thing that happens. The crab eater seal might not only be eaten by the leopard seal, but it could also be eaten by a killer whale. Or the crab eater seal might not only eat krill, but it might also eat squid. Or it could eat other fish, etc. So a food web actually shows you all the possibilities that in the food in, in the environment, not necessarily just one step. Here's another example. If you look up here, most of these, you know, here's step one, two, three. That's a three-step food chain. Here's one, two, three. That's a three-step food chain. Now I can go over here and go one, two, three, four. So notice that an owl or a hawk can be the third or the secondary consumer in one food chain, but it would be a tertiary consumer in another food chain. So it can occupy different places in different food chains depending on where it is. Now, if you look up here, there are some that are even... Um, there are some food chains where they can be synonymous. Like some in this one, spiders, some spiders eat these predaceous insects, and some predaceous insects are big enough to eat spiders. So depending on the size of the insect and which one hits the spider first, I guess, depends on which one wins out. All right? Now, um, next, when we talk about trophic levels, I've already mentioned this. A trophic level is a feeding step. You know, usually the first trophic level is producer, the second trophic level third, fourth is consumers. Now usually only about 10%, very important, need to remember this, only about 10% of the energy that originally came from the sun is moved to each trophic level. So if we think back to our food chain, let's say for example, grass, cow, Kennedy. Probably one of my favorite food chains. And let's say that the grass got 100 percent or 100 units of that original energy from the sun, when the cow eats the grass, it only gets 10 percent of what's left out of that 100. All right, the reason is some of it's going to be lost as heat to the environment, the grass is going to be using it to grow, uh, respire, metabolize. Now when I actually eat a steak, I only get 1 percent of the original 100 percent. Because the cow used it to run around, to, to break down food that it ate, etc. So as you go up a food chain, you decrease by about 10% of the energy. Now it can change, it can vary between 5 and 20, but we usually think of 10% is what's there. Now, something else I want to show you about over here on the right. This is called an ecological pyramid. And it basically shows you that the bottom level has the most energy. The red level there has the, the next amount of energy. The green level has the next, next amount. And then the blue level has the least amount of energy. This is showing four trophic levels. Trophic level one, two, three, four. And now according to this, trophic level two has more energy than trophic level three and four. Okay, so that makes sense. There's also another thing that's being shown here. And what it is called is called biomass. Okay. So what biomass is, biomass is the amount of living material there, and there's actually more trees, plants, flowers that make up the biomass down here, the producer biomass, than there is the next one, the, the herbivores, the omnivores. And then when you go up, there's less of these. And that makes sense if you think about it in a, in a food chain way. It makes sense that there's going to be less higher order um consumers than there are producers because if you have more more up on the top level then you would run out of food so it, it goes it decreases as it goes up so when I think of an ecological pyramid I not only look at the amount of energy decreases as you go up but also the biomass decreases 
Now, the main reason that most energy is lost is heat. Important to remember, uh, you'll probably see that on a fill in the blank somewhere on the text. All right? Okay, um, now just to reiterate, energy only goes in one direction. Matter or nutrients are recycled, which I showed you on the previous uh, food chains. All right, the last thing I want to end up with is a thing called biomagnification. And biomagnification is something that says that particles increase in concentration as you move up a food chain. All right, an example here would be DDT. DDT is a pesticide that was used during the Vietnam War. And when the people in the United States started using it, uh, they didn't see any side effects. And the reason is because when they measured the water, like in streams and lakes and rivers, there would be very little DDT in the water. 0 0.000003 parts per million DDT was taken in the water. But as you notice, when they saw that the small animals, the microscopic, microscopic animals that ate or lived in the water, it went from that parts per million to 0 .04, point, 0 0.04 parts per million. Now, when the small minnows, whenever it, they ate those zooplankton, it increased by 0.5. Whenever a larger fish ate it, it was up to two parts per million. And then when large birds like ospreys ate those fish, it got up to 25. So it magnified in intensity. So what, and what ended up happening is you had these higher order organisms that were found on higher trophic levels. They were starting to um, have complications that weren't seen in the previous levels. Uh, for example, condors. You had birds that were, condors were found up on the trophic level. They started being born uh, with beaks that were turned sideways, you know, so they couldn't eat properly. Uh, they laid eggs that were soft-shelled, which was very detrimental to the birds. Uh, they didn't survive, so their population decreased dramatically. You can even think of it in, um, in fish, you know, in North Carolina. Uh, mercury, for example. Mercury... It can be found in water and not be harmful, but then when, as you move up the food chain and you get to a fish like a tuna, which is a, a large predator, um, it can be in such concentration that it can be potentially harmful. You might hear sometimes on the news to not eat the tuna or not eat the shellfish, the oysters or the clams or whatever because of the mercury levels. Well, this is biomagnification, and um, we got to realize that it can cause damage as it moves up. All right, guys, I hope this helped you with food chains and food webs. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and you have a nice day.